I'm Juliana Margulies, actor, activist, mother. And I'm Erin Marin, writer, activist, mother. Child sexual abuse affects everyone, the wealthy and the poor, boys and girls, friends and family. It spares no community, culture, religion, or race. In the United States alone, one in four girls will be sexually assaulted by their 18th birthday. And one in six boys will too. Three million children are already survivors of sexual assault. I'm one of them. I suffered in silence for years before I could speak out about the horrors I experienced. I lived in a world of guilt and shame and stayed silent because I felt responsible for what happened to me. At 13, I realized I had to speak up. And now my mission is to remove the stigma and shame surrounding sexual abuse and empower survivors to speak out. That is why I created Aaron's Law. Aaron's Law is prevention oriented, bringing sexual abuse education into public schools using age appropriate techniques. Thanks to Aaron's Law, children are being taught to recognize abuse and are learning what to do if they need assistance. Children who have been sexually abused are terrified of asking for help. They're afraid of hurting others or getting hurt themselves and not being believed. We must end their silence. But we need your help. First, learn more about Erin and her story through Speak Truth to Power. Then, become a human rights defender. If your state hasn't passed Erin's law, you have the opportunity to make a lasting difference for millions of children. Empowering children to protect themselves and ask for help must always be our priority. Together, we can get Aaron's Law passed in every state, giving millions of children a powerful voice that will prevent and end suffering. Learn more about my story, the stories of other human rights defenders who have changed our world, and how students can help pass this law by visiting the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Truth to Power curriculum at rfkhumanrights.org. Join us in speaking truth to power. Thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for all of the work that you do and that you've done for so long. I want to ask you, let's start by asking, when did you realize that education was the missing component and what you were going to dedicate you know, uh, your life to? Actually, it was... Um reading my little pink childhood diary that I kept all my secrets locked away in, that one of the passages read, I sobbed the whole way home, over and over I thought about what just happened. Officer Friendly teaches us, don't talk to strangers. Don't answer the door and my parents are gone. They don't warn us in school about the people we know and trust. They didn't warn me about my cousin. And I remember reading this passage going, yeah, they don't warn us about the people you know and trust. We just get educated on stranger danger when 93% of the time kids are being sexually abused by someone they know and trust. And that's when I started reaching out to my legislators, looking at legislation. We require tornado drills, bus drills, fire drills. We teach kids DARE, the eight ways to say no to drugs. But when it comes to sexual abuse, the only message kids get is to keep it a secret. I know where you live. No one will believe you. We allow these predators to have too much power and control over children. So I made it my mission in my home state of Illinois to get Aaron's law passed. Um, seven years ago, my state senator said, Aaron, you're talking about sexual abuse. You'll never get this passed. Why would they say that? Because he said, because of the topic, because it's sexual abuse and it's taboo. And he said, they'll never talk to kids about this. Yeah, I agree, we should talk to kids about it, but they'll never teach this in school. And I said, it's that attitude that I'm gonna change. And if you're not gonna help me, I will find somebody that will. And that's what I did. I went and found another state legislator and got it passed in 2013 in my home state of Illinois. But kids are not just being abused in my state. They're being abused around this world. So for the past seven years, I've traveled from one state capital after another, testifying to legislators. And I can stand here today and said it's been passed in 31 states. It's unbelievable. Where, there you go. Um, were you surprised when you first started going, uh, speaking to legislators? I mean, you know, speaking to this person in Illinois, like, were you surprised to find that there was a stigma around talking about sexual assault and, and, and abuse in schools, rather than something that maybe they just hadn't talked about because they just hadn't done it, but that there was actually a stigma? 
No, I wasn't surprised at all because that's society for you. We sweep it under the rug, look the other way, and we don't want to talk about it. Even when there's these big media stories out there, it's out there for a week, and then it's hush-hush again. We're not going to talk about it. Even though the reality is one in four girls and one in six boys is sexually abused by the age of 18. And there's people that think that this is teaching kids sex ed. This is not sex ed. This is personal body safety, age-appropriate curriculum teaching kids. The difference is between safe touch, unsafe touch, safe secrets, unsafe secrets. That if someone is touching you in the areas that are co covered by your swimsuit, you tell somebody immediately. You will be believed this is not your fault. Because that's what predators tell kids. This is your fault. They place this fear and power over children to stay silent. Where did you, uh, how did you find age appropriate teachings? There is curriculum throughout this country that's age appropriate. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, that, you know, in Florida and New Jersey, there's programs in Washington that people can find actually right on my website, aaronslaw.org, um, of different curriculum and books. There's stuff available out there. People just need to do the research and see that there's stuff you can use in these classrooms. Yeah. Joanne, how did you get involved with, with Aaron? Uh, 2012, I was asked to give Erin a Woman of the Year Award for Glamour Magazine. And um, I read her bio and thought, yeah, I'm going to give this woman an award. <laughs> she deserves many. So I gave her the award and then stood um, behind her and listened to her speech. And I was so moved, I said afterwards, how can I help? And what did she say? <laughs> she what said, happened? oh, great. <laughs> And now she bothers me every day. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, you know, unfor I mean, the, the unfortunate part is that I feel like this is just a common sense law. I, you know, the same way we wear seatbelts, right? We, to pr protect us from what might happen. It's just common sense. Um, and obviously, 31 states believe that. New York, sadly, is not one of them, um, which we're going to change. Oh, yeah. Um, but but I I... I really feel like um, now's the time to strike as hard as we can. It feels like the dialogue has been opened. And even though it's unfortunate circumstances, I feel like it's a time for change. And one of the things that I feel strongly about is that if Aaron's law was implemented in schools 30, 40 years ago, I wonder if all this sexual harassment dialogue that's been happening would be even happening today if we had all been armed mm -hmm with a way to protect ourselves. Or even from a very early age, instilled with the idea of what is appropriate and what's not appropriate in agency over our own bodies. Well, it, it gives you power. Yeah. I mean, little children are so innocent. Mm -hmm. They don't know, and they believe these stupid grown-ups. You know, they believe what they are told, and they're incredibly trusting. And so when that trust, I mean, you know, as, it, as Aaron said, when that trust is broken, you know, why aren't we nipping this in the bud early rather than finding out our kid is on her heroin, you know, in a halfway house and can't function? And when we find out why, they say, well, because, you know, mm -hmm. Joe, the teacher, was sexually abusing me. Parents can't see it. And so Aaron's giving these kids tools and parents tools to detect if something is going on with their child. Um. When did you decide that you wanted to dedicate yourself to these tools and, 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 and helping both kids and parents? Well, growing up outside Chicago, I was raised in that good home, and I met my best friend in kindergarten, and my very first overnight, I was sexually abused by the uncle that lived in the home. And this abuse continued, six, seven, eight, eventually being raped, and I moved. I moved away from this man, never to be abused again, but moving got me that much closer to the next perpetrator of my life, and it's a family member an older teenage cousin sexually abusing me and telling me, no one will believe you, you'll destroy our family. So I wrote about it in the diary, and it wasn't until I was 13 my 11-year-old sister came to me and said, he's doing it to you too, telling me that she was also being sexually abused by this same cousin. We broke our silence, and reclaiming my voice, I went down a destructive path, suicide attempt, depression, self-injury, and it was my junior year of high school that I confronted my older cousin and let him hear all my anger and eventually forgave him. Got the apology, forgave him, and decided to put a face and voice on the silent epidemic by taking this little pink diary and my senior year of high school, turning it into a book called Stolen Innocence. And my goal through that was to give a voice to the voiceless, 
to allow all those silent people that are 30, 40, 50 and have not found their voice, the ability to break their silence and know that they have nothing to be ashamed of, this is not their fault, and they too can stand up and speak out against this silent epidemic. And that's one of the horrible aspects about sexual assault and abuse and harassment mm-hmm. in this probably in the world, but I know, I mean, in this country specifically is the shame that goes along with being a victim because of how we talk about victims and where we place victims rather than where we place the, the perpetrators. How difficult was it for you to sort of overcome that, I mean, whether that, that shame that so often is oh, a part yeah, of Oh, yeah, no, I didn't want to talk about it. I pushed it down. I wanted to avoid it because I felt like nobody understood. It was that dirty topic, mm-hmm. you know, that I thought people were going to look at me and, oh, she's used and abused. I even had one of my best friends tell me um, several months after I disclosed my abuse, you're not being abused anymore. Shouldn't you be over this? She didn't understand the side effects of the nightmares, the flashbacks of how it was constantly haunting me because she hadn't lived it. And that's what I tell parents. I say, "You, you can't think that you live in that good community, that this would never happen to your kids. You can't assume that your children will come tell you if this is happening and only talk to your kids about stranger danger because they don't understand the power and control predators have over children. The only education they're getting when this education is not in the classroom is from the predators. You stay silent, and that's what we need to end. We need to put these sex offenders out of business, and that's my calling in life. Um, My calling in life, and I tell these legislators, I'm not going away, I'm gonna become your biggest headache, and eventually you're gonna get sick of me, you're just gonna pass this law. Have you found that they've passed laws upon me? God, just passed the law. <laughs> just out of annoyance. I actually, in a quick example I can give you in my home state, I was warned by a representative that was going to be hearing the bill, was going to be voting against it because she's been against um, school mandates her entire career as a legislator. And after I testified, she got on the mic, broke down and cried, and said had this law existed when she was a child, she would have broken her silence. But like me, she was told to keep it a secret and she had been sexually abused throughout her childhood. Nobody knew that this has happened, happened to her. It's the first time she supported a school mandate. But I think it's important um, for you to explain why Aaron's law works. Because I know that there's a lot of um, people out there that think, well, is this a sex ed class? Which it's not. It's age appropriate teachings by professionals that um, teach children sexual abuse prevention. Um, and, and I'm going to let you tell the story because it's a fantastic story of why it works. And, and it's proven over and over again. The same way it was proven after much research that less people were dying when they put their seatbelts on. Yeah. Um, last November in my home state of Illinois, a um, nine-year-old came forward that she had been sexually abused starting at the age of three until she was seven by a mom's boyfriend And it was right immediately after an Aaron's Law presentation that the media put out there that the child went up and told her teacher what mom's boyfriend had done. And he was put away for 40 years. An even bigger story that just came out in August was a Maryland man, where I traveled and testified and got Aaron's Law passed. A Maryland man, a teacher, had sexually abused children for 15 years, used his power as a teacher to silence these kids in the classroom. And it was during an Aaron's Law presentation the presentation wasn't even over. 12-year-old put her head on the desk, said that this teacher had been sexually abusing her for two years. Go to find out he had sexually abused multiple students. This was a man that had been given many warnings for having students in his lap. They even made him sign an agreement saying he will no longer, after he was confronted three times, he will no longer have children sitting in his lap. This school system failed these kids. And this man now is spending the next 48 years behind bars. Think about that for a moment. 48 years that had this law never been taught for that one hour, how many more victims he would have had. But hey, 15 years earlier, if this had been out there, we'd have a lot less victims. That's unbelievable. And do you find, uh, I mean, outside of sort of finding perpetrators in the midst of the moment like that, you also find, like, what are some of the stats on on prevention? Well, yeah, I, I have to tell people, you know, even with parents understanding what a predator looks like, the grooming process that these predators go through, that person that wants to spend extra time with your child, giving extra attention to them. And in the instances with kids, the warning signs to look for, the bedwetting, the academic changes, the A's and B's to C's and D's, the appetite changes, suddenly losing a bunch of weight, complaining of stomach aches, all of a sudden love to go to soccer practice and now is avoiding it, doesn't, doesn't want to you know, be by the coach. Suddenly 
doesn't like going to the family functions, the Christmas parties, the birthday parties, because it's going on in the home and parents, you know, at another relative's home don't realize that this is really happening. And the statistics, as I said, show one in four girls, one in six boys sexually abused by the age of 18. There are 42 million survivors in America alone of childhood sexual abuse. We're just talking about America. I think when we talk about shame, there's also a shame on the part of the parents as well that they have to sort of to have to come to terms with the, their child being abused and them not being able to be there to protect them mm -hmm. and then having to sort of come around to that is even harder and they remain in denial quite often. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Well, and there's, there's just a lot of blame, guilt. This is my fault. How did I miss the warning signs? Um, and a lot of children that are being abused, they often don't go to the parent because they want to protect mom and dad. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of hurting mom and dad. And that's why I tell parents, sit down with your kids and figure out five safe adults you can go to. If you don't want to go to mom and dad, who is somebody else you can go to with this? A teacher, grandma, you know, a family friend. Who are safe adults in your life that you can go to? And getting across to kids that I won't be upset if you don't want to come to me. You know, because kids, they want to protect their parents. I was one of them. I didn't want my parents to be hurt. I didn't want my parents to feel like they failed to giving, up, giving us the, you know, perfect childhood. Do you feel a lot of what you're talking about with Aaron's law, as much as you're talking about a law and passing legislation, you are also talking about a certain amount of uh, being a mindful adult around children and noticing changes, noticing differences, and making sure that you know you are very thoughtful about mm -hmm. what your child is going through? Oh, yeah. And I tell parents, look for those red flags. I tell teachers, we need to educate the educators on the red flags going on in the classrooms with the students you know, that are being abused. As with one in four girls, one in six boys, these students, teachers, these students are sitting in your classroom. And also the proper way to handle it. Because as a society, we handle this terribly. When a child discloses, being a mandated reporter throughout this country, when a child discloses abuse, you often have that teacher, that principal, instead of calling the authorities, instead of calling Child Protective Services, they're calling mom and saying, hey, your five-year-old or seven-year-old is saying that dad is doing this, that stepdad is doing this. What is any mother going to do? She's not going to call the police. She's going to get on the phone or confront him that night. That child is put back in the home that night before the authorities get involved the next day. And that child is now recanting because of the fear, the shame, the not wanting to believe that dad would do this. I can't tell you how many sad stories I hear of moms not believing their children or not standing by them because they say, if you repeat this to anybody else, you're going to be put in foster care. So we need kids to understand that there are other safe adults you can go to in your school, and we need teachers to be properly trained on the red flags to look for and what to do in a situation when a child discloses abuse. You don't call home. You call the authorities. I think this goes back to what you were saying as well, that if we sort of teach these ideas at a young age, when these people become adults, we will no longer do the kind of disservice that we do to victims of sexual assault as adults, right? Because as of right now, both with children and as adults, so often when something is reported, we do a disservice to the victims and a service to the perpetrator by in, uh, inadvertently protecting them. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an absurd uh, way to go about <laughs> trying to protect innocent people. Um, I mean, my... It, it's uh, to hear, well, what was she wearing? Mm -hmm. um, even if she was wearing a mini skirt and no panties, I don't care what she was wearing. It, rape is rape. Exactly. Um, sexual abuse is sexual abuse. So um, it's very difficult for victims to come forward. Um, most of them don't want to because they get grilled and they, mm -hmm. they get <laughs> thrown under the bus every time. And nine times out of ten, um, nothing happens. So I think, you know, giving these kids tools young uh, gives them boundaries. They understand. It gives them power, boy and girl. This isn't a, this isn't a gender issue. Um, it's an all-inclusive issue. And I think that uh, it will also help boys to understand to treat women as they grow older in a, in a better mm -hmm. light, hold them in a better light and treat them well. And it will teach girls that men can be safe, that men can be good, that it's okay to trust this one, but not that one. <laughs> you know, to understand the difference between safe touch, not safe touch. When a man grabs your arm, big red flag. Don't just brush that under the carpet. Why would someone grab my arm and bruise it? Why am I now on a second date with this man? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it goes on and on and on. and. Um, I, I just think that there's, there's a, 
real need for this law right now, and especially because as a parent, I know I can't be there all the time for my kid. I mean, I, you know, I, I would kill someone if they, I don't mind going to jail for a year, for the rest of my life. If someone, I found out someone was harming my child, that's a ridiculous response, I know. It's not sane, but. It's a natural response. No, it is the natural <laughs> yeah. response. I but, think it's the same um, thing. But, and he knows that about me, and I realized, oh, he knows that about me. He won't tell me. Oh, interesting. Because he doesn't want me to go away to, to jail. jail for the rest of my life. I, I started realizing our words, right. as I've been working with Aaron, our words, those kids, they're sponges. They are. And they take it all in, and then they repeat it back to mm -hmm. you. And so now's the time to learn. There's no wrong time to learn. There's nothing inappropriate about learning to protect yourself. And I think because it's called sexual abuse prevention, a lot of more conservative people think that it's sex education. It's not. Which it's not. Not at all. Which um, they should also not be opposed to that, but should we not? They, they shouldn't. I mean, yeah. maybe for a four-year-old. Yeah, um, well, they age should, appropriate. But also the other thing that I think has been sort of misconstrued about this law is that it's all we're asking for is one hour a year. We're not asking for a weekly course on sexual abuse prevention. It's one hour with uh, age-appropriate language, doesn't scare children, it gives them tools and it gives them courage and it's all done by professionals. And it's what I always say about the gun laws, you know, common sense background checks. We're not saying get rid of your guns, I am, but we're not. Um, <laughs> High five on that. <laughs> Um, what we're saying is common sense background checks. Anyone who's entitled to hold a gun must be held accountable, made sure that they're, you know, sane human beings. Same with Aaron's Law. It's just common sense. Let's give our kid every tool in the shed to, to allow them to protect themselves when we can't. And I think this world would be a lot more beautiful if we could at least give them the chance. What I tell people is, you know, go on the Aaron's Law website, see where your state is. And if your state has not passed this law, contact your legislators. Start writing your senators, start writing your representatives. If you have a personal story, share it with them. These legislators don't just need to hear from me as I spend eight hours a day sitting there typing every legislator in the country. They need to hear from the people in their state. Um, Power in numbers. Especially here in New York. I've fought for five years from this and the bill continues to be killed by one woman. Who a woman. The, the, One woman. Who was the woman that is ki killing the bill? Her name is Representative Kathy Nolan. The Senate all passes it in full support. Then it ends up in the Education Committee in the, in the House of Representatives. She chairs the um, Education Committee, and she refuses for five years now to call the bill for a hearing um, because she's against school mandates. She feels this bill should be left up to the State Board of Education, and legislators should not control what schools do. So she refuses. It's amazing but to me what I've we learned have fire about fire drills. Oh, exactly. Man fire drills are mandates. Yeah. Why? Tornado because drills. we want to keep our children safe. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's a no-brainer. Sort of it's a no-brainer. Yeah. Simply because of ideologically she doesn't believe that legislate people should legislate what the schools do. Exactly. That's our whole thing. But we legislate tornado drills, bus drills, all these other important things. It doesn't make any sense. It do and especially because it's just one hour a year. Exactly. I can understand if they were saying, well, it's disruptive to the school. You're coming in every week, and blah, blah, blah. but we're not. It's one hour a year. Wow. It plants the seed, and it's amazing what, what effect it has. What is her name again? Representative Kathy Nolan. Start Representative Kathy, Kathy Nolan. Nolan. If you guys are watching this, send her some letters. Yes. Send her letters. Call her, Please do. Her letters. Save our kids. Yes. <laughs> Let's get some questions from the audience here. Who has a question? Hi, ladies. Um, thank you for being here. I've actually tried to start a conversation with people in my life about sexual abuse and the harms and everything that comes with it, but I always get, seem to get the answer of, oh, you can't believe everything you read on the internet. You can't believe these stats. You can't believe this and this. How can I start a productive conversation with these people in my life and have them kind of get away from their state of denial? Well, I would say show them the statistics you know, sit there and explain to them. When you look at the statistics of how many people are diagnosed with autism, breast cancer, all these other things, more children are abused every year and disclose abuse than all those numbers combined. So you gotta put the numbers in front of their face. You gotta put a face and voice with it. And when you can share those stories of others coming forward and say, hey, look what has happened to this person. 
I mean, it's really putting other faces and voices to it and the numbers behind it for people to understand. Using that 42 million, you know, survivors here in America, that's powerful. That, that's 46 national football stadiums being filled of people that have been sexually abused. That's, that's 3 million of them, 3 million kids. It's 42, or 46 national football stadiums. Next question. I, first of all, I want to commend you both for giving your time to this and Aaron to take something that must have been so horrific in your personal life and turn it into a positive message that may save a lot of people this, mm -hmm. this uh, same kind of experience. Uh, because it does seem so common sense, you described why it hasn't passed in New York, but what about the other states? Is there, are there typical roadblocks that, you know, what are the arguments against it? Yeah, the biggest roadblock um, throughout the country for years now has been, it, Aaron, great idea, this is an unfunded mandate. Where are schools going to find the funding to teach this, purchase the curriculum, outside educators? The great thing is, um, thanks to Juliana, she had uh, told uh, Representative, or no, U.S. Senator Gillenbrandt here in New York about Aaron's law, and she introduced the federal version, which federally funds the bill. And President Obama signed that in December 2015, and those funds were just released in July. $400 million that schools can use. It's packaged with some other bills that can be used, that funding, but Aaron's law is in there that can be used for schools, the State Board of Ed, to distribute money to schools to use purchase curriculum, hire programs to come in and teach. So legislators can't say this is an unfunded mandate. And ever since that passed, so many more states are totally behind it now, Get jumping on board when I send them that information. That's amazing. What is that like to affect change like that? To speak to Kirsten Gillibrand and have her sort of push something and the president to sign it and to see these states enact the legislation that you've been pushing for? You know, I said, I wanted to get the subject talked about. I wanted to put it out there. And as I started this journey, my state legislator said, we don't talk about this. And I made it a point that we will talk about it. I never imagined it was going to come to this. You know, sitting next to her, the lady I watched as a little kid on ER, um, you know, meeting the president, you know, these big, but that was my goal. My goal was to change the way society talks about this and to open up their eyes and to continue as you hear these stories. Jerry Sandusky, Pastor Stephen Collins from Seventh Heaven, the Duggars. You know, these stories you keep hearing about, it's happening. And we can't just keep rushing it under the carpet. Um, we need to talk about it. We can't let these stories of Weinstein just disappear because there's so many other people out there that this is happening to, public figures that are doing committing these crimes that we need to shine a light on and we need to keep this conversation going. We can't just have this conversation every couple years when some breaking story happens. Uh, next question, right here. Hello, I'd like to take this conversation a little bit further and ask you, what do you think about having some sort of legislature where you keep saying that we need to educate the educators yet the main educators are our parents? and yet the boyfriend could be the same perpetrator, or you can have a son who's gonna be a, the teenager, the, the same one like your cousin, yet there is absolutely no screening process for parenting, or no one ever educates how do you raise and become a really good parent, or how do you raise your kids? So don't you think that the core really would be there, and how do we perhaps even start thinking about really educating the educators? What I say is we can't force parents to take parenting classes. Um, I mean, you look at people, the only ones that can go through parenting classes and screened are people adopting children, you know, and they're often far more fit than some of these parents out there that have kids. So what we've been doing with Aaron's Law is doing parent nights for having parents to come in and being educated on this, on the warning signs to look for, on the prevention aspect, on how to talk to your kids about this, but it's not required. It's optional if parents want to attend this or not. But the good thing is when parents hear that this is being talked about, if it's dad, stepdad, you know, some other family member that is doing this in the home, at least someone else in the home that's not abusing them may start talking to their kids about this and having that dialogue and that conversation. You know, mom's telling me this, but my dad's telling me to be quiet about it. Well, I've now been given this voice to speak up. Mom says I'll be believed. Mom has no idea that it's happening in the home. And the perpetrators need to understand there are severe consequences for this. And I tell teenagers, I mean, there's peer on peer. You know, there's teenagers do this to other teenagers. And I, you know, I tell teenagers this. You know, there are severe consequences. And if you ever find yourself having the urge to do something like this, get help. It's far better to get help and own up to this and admit it than find yourself labeled as a sex offender the rest of your life and locked up behind bars.
You also said, though, uh, teaching kids to think of five adults that they can speak to sort of also uh, kind of bypasses the problem of, of a, to a degree, of parents maybe not being as involved as they could be. If a child has written down or mm -hmm. thinks of five adults, you know, prior to it happening or during it's happening, they have that those names that they can reach out to, that people they take, that they're the, that they trust. Well, exactly, especially when a kid's being threatened by dad, stepdad, about mom, I'm going to hurt mom, I'm going to kill mom. Well, kid's not going to go to mom fearing that, you know, mom's going to be harmed possibly. So, you know, who's that other person that they can trust? And we often point to the school because children, they're one of their place outside the home, they spend most of their time, it's in the school. They have that relationship with their teacher, with the principal, with the school social worker. So building that relationship that with kids to understand there are other people you can go to in life and, you know, and Talk about this. How can people, uh, well, aaronslaw.org, what can people do to help? Like I said, reach out to your state lawmakers. Start writing them. Um, get behind this and, you know, tell them. We need to pass this. Um, tell your friends and family to do the same. You know, get other people on board and get educated. You know, post this website on your social media pages to educate others because I can't tell you how many people will start commenting under it saying, me too and start taking action to do something. And Juliana, you're also uh, an advocate for the Brady Center of Gun Violence. What can people do to help the Brady Center as well? Oh, uh, well, yeah, uh, you can go on to um, bradycampaign.org and, and help as much as you can. I mean, it's, it's one of those things, again, common sense, but since um, less than two months ago, that huge massacre in Las Vegas, um, and as we've been sitting here, the number has gone up, but um, over 900 people have been shot in this country dead since the Las Vegas massacre. Um, so we need to change our gun laws. And, uh, and the bump stock legislation is essentially stalled at this point as well. It's, it's, I mean, it was dead on arrival. They it's knew appalling. What they were All of it's appalling. Um, and, and we have to do something. And there is power in numbers, and we have to raise our voices loud really loud. I mean, we can't sit here anymore and watch innocent people being shot. Um, it's, and, and nine times out of 10, if you own a gun in your home, you or someone in your home are the people that get killed. It's this weird thought that the future might be a place where if, not, if no action takes place, like we're, we all just sort of live with the regular fear of gun violence on, on a, yeah, on a I mean, basis. Yeah, I mean, it's infuriating that, that we, 90% of Americans, including gun owners, mm -hmm. all agree with common sense background checks, and yet we can't get the law passed because the NRA holds so much power over Congress because of money. That's not right, and we have got to change it. So, you know, any help we can get just by people saying, I'm for it, so we can get laws passed. So go to um, BradyCampaign.org um, to get more information. But it is amazing. I was writing a speech um, last week for last night's event um, that I did with Aaron. And in the speech, at the time I wrote, you know, since the Las Vegas massacre, there's been 800 murders. And then yesterday I was going over the speech and I thought, I better double check my stats. And it was over 900 in a week. Well, what who are we? Who are we that we're allowing this to happen? And why, why is the government putting party before humanity, before country, before what's right? I don't, I don't understand it. And I just don't want, I don't, I don't want to see it anymore. I'm done. It wasn't enough that innocent, 20 innocent children and six teachers got shot. We have to keep watching it over and over again. It's, um, but no one talked about the 900 that died because it wasn't an event. And even that event, um, even even that event didn't last as long as it should have. Even that it event disappears within, into within thin days. air. They talk about it. We feel bad. You know, this is a man that, by the way, the man in the Oval Office did not say give him the death sentence. Why? Because he's white, and he's a gun owner. That's why he has a right to bear arms. Now, what just happened in New York is appalling, but for the leader of our free world to not condemn that, not condemn a man in, in Charlottesville running over a woman who's, a, who's an innocent bystander at a white supremacist rally, for him not to say the same thing about what he said to a Muslim 
is appalling, and we have to speak up. We can't just sit by and think other people are going to do it because one person makes a difference. Do you know how many lives she's changed? <laughs> I mean it. It's true. And she's tiny. <laughs> tiny but mighty. She's tiny, exactly. So. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do. Uh, everybody, go to uh, Aaron'sLaw.org. Also, check out uh, the Brady campaign to enter to end gun violence. I, I, I Make always, it all good. Also oh, follow. It. Also follow on Twitter, Aaron yes. Marin. Also follow Aaron Marin on on Twitter. I don't think you're on Twitter, are you? <laughs> yeah. No, apparently someone is as me, but it's not me. I don't tweet. <laughs> So I, honestly, I don't. I get weird messages from my friends saying, did you just, no, it's not me. <laughs> no, I'm not on social media. So just watch her on TV in, in syndication or watch her in movies that are coming show up. out. Or she'll just come here, yeah. I prefer to show up. Uh, give a round of applause for Juliana and Aaron. Thank you.